This is a production of Cornell University. Thank you, Jan. Uh, that was a very generous introduction. And thank you all for coming. Um, it's great. So uh, over the decades, I've been uh, astounded repeatedly by the discoveries that reveal layers of sophisticated mechanisms that have evolved uh, to regulate transcription of our genomes. Uh, the transcription needs to be orchestrated uh, at our 20,000 or so mRNA encoding genes, uh, but also at the tRNAs, the ribosomal RNA genes, the long non-coding RNAs, the divergent transcripts that we now know are associated with many promoters and enhancers, regulatory enhancers. And this pattern of transcription is not static in cells, um, but responds to a spectrum of signals, including uh, those developmental signals that take us from a fertilized egg to an adult or a seed to a plant. Um, signals that occur in response to changes in, in uh, nutrition or the environment, and of course, changes that occur uh, in response to disease. So um, the, this regulatory specificity relies very heavily on a large number of short DNA sequence elements uh, that uh, interact with hundreds of factors uh, transcription factors, protein factors, either directly or indirectly. And some of these sequence elements reside in this region um, very close to where the gene begins, transcription sites, called the core, core promoter. These elements uh, interact with a set of general transcription factors that direct polymerase to the point, uh, proper point of initiation. Additionally, there are um, elements that reside further upstream and provide a chemical complement for the binding of uh, regu other regulatory factors. These elements and the factors can sometimes be in large clusters that can reside large distances from the position of the, of the gene, sometimes in, uh, over a million bases away, and still influence the transcription at the gene target rather dramatically. Now, it was thought initially that these regulatory factors might uh, affect the recruitment or the activation of polymerase directly by direct interactions, but more often than not, we now know that there are co-regulators, often multi-subunit complexes uh, that, that, it, that the regulatory factors interact with, be they nearby or at enhancers. Uh, these come in several flavors. Some of those types of, of co-regulatory factors are the mediator, which is this 20 some subunit complex that where different factors some plug in. And there are other subunits that then interact with the polymerase itself. There are HATs, histone acetyltransferases, modified chromatin. There are remodelers that can push nucleosomes around. And, uh, and so the, a lot of these subunits that are part of co-regulators not only influence polymerase and its activity, the recruitment of polymerase and its activity, but they can all also influence the uh, chromatin structure, making it a better or worse place for transcription. And finally, there are insulators, uh, these mysterious, still mysterious components that restrict where enhancers can <laughs> broadcast their signal to. You don't want genes activated willy-nilly, and the insulator helps prevent uh, act activation of improper genes, and also, I think, helps direct the enhancer to its proper target. So uh, in addition to, well, to understand regulation and how it works mechanistically, we, we need to know all of these elements and factors and their interplay, but we also need to know what steps in the transcription cycle are rate limiting. What, what are the slow steps that, that are accelerated by regulatory signals? And there are multiple points in uh, the transcription cycle from chromatin opening to the pre-initiation complex formation, initiation, promoter proximal pausing, release from pausing, productive elongation, termination, and finally, the recycling of the polymerase to another round of transcription. And there are transcription factors associated with uh, the, the DNA, near, you know, either nearby or in enhancers that can influence this process and influence any of these steps in principle. Although it seems like the early steps in transcription are where, what's primarily regulated. Uh, we, over the years, became fascinated or 
some, some would argue, obsessed with, with this phenomenon of promoter proximal pausing, uh, which happened later than what textbooks tell you uh, regulation, where regulation should be happening. And, uh, and it involves, um, we, after polymerase initiates, we find that polymerases move to a, a, a few tens of bases to a pause site and can hang out there for, for some period of time, getting a proper signal, and then the polymerase can be released into productive elongation. Okay, so let me just blow that area up a little bit and you can just see it a little more clearly here. There are, there's pausing taking place where there are specific factors involved, <coughs> protein complexes, NELF and BSIF that help stabilize the pause. There's probably interactions between the polymerase and the general transcription factors that brought the polymerase there that, that probably uh, we, we think keep the polymerase from, this, from, from uh, readily leaving the locus and helping to stabilize the pause. And finally, there's probably some com component of regulation at some of the pause sites that are due to the barrier caused by nucleosomes. So upon uh, activation of genes, uh, we, we have other you know, factors that can bring in uh, a, a kinase, that, uh, it's rather famous kinase. There are rather a lot of major changes that take place, but one of the most significant changes is the recruitment of a PTFB kinase, which can phosphorylate these pausing factors and the polymerase itself causing NELF to leave, DSIF to be transformed to an elongation factor, and polymerase now to change its modification state, it can then take on a new entourage of factors that help it with its movement through these vast distances through the genes and chromatin, but also coordinate the transcription with co-transcriptional RNA processing. Okay, so shortly after arriving at Cornell back in the dark ages in 78, uh, uh, I started dreaming about ways of dissecting how eukaryotic mechanisms work in, and, uh, and, uh, and I thought it would be worth looking in, in the natural context. Many people were doing a strict biochemical approach. My, I was in a biochemistry section that really liked pure proteins and I was going to work on dirty whole cell methodologies and do, try to do biochemistry. But I thought um, this would complement the traditional biochemical approaches where people were purifying all the components involved in transcription and then trying to reconstruct the process in, in, in a test tube. And so over the years, uh, our laboratory has uh, emphasized an embarrassingly uh, simple strategy. It's a simple-minded approach of, of simply taking live cells, observing them, perturbing them, and then reobserving them, okay? And and our uh, reasoning is that you could look at genes and genomes and transcription factors and the polymerase, the machine of transcription itself, and the nucleosomes. If we could look at these at the highest possible re res resolution, both spatial and temporal, we might be able to learn something about transcription and how it works and at least put some limits on models that we're considering. And then we could perturb the, this process either by turning on or pressing genes and response to specific signals, but we could also make mutants and transcription factors or do RNAi or drugs that inhibit particular components, RNA aptamers that might interfere with macromolecular interactions or use of degrons to get rid of proteins and thereby perturb the process in a very specific way and then reobserve as soon as possible after the perturbation to see what the immediate effect, the first order effect of, of these perturbations are. Now we can't always do them these assays immediately after with a lot of these perturbations, but some of them you can. So the outline of the talk today is that we're gonna try and cover the T-Chalk as a model system. And we're gonna start off in an optical view. It'll be easy to, easy to take, I think, for most people. It's, it's always nice to have uh, movies and pictures. Promoter proximal pausing is the second part. You'll see it's a critical step in, in uh, expression of Drosophila and mammalian genes, very broadly, a critical step. And finally, we'll do a, a, a genome-wide analysis of transcription regulatory mechanisms in Drosophila, but also mouse and human, and, uh, and drill down a little bit in, in terms of mechanism. Okay, so heat shock response. So um, we, we picked the Drosophila system as a model. I picked this early on, going to Dave Hognes' lab. Uh, it was, the reasons were the, the genes are robustly activated, 
many genes over, you know, induced 200 fold. You can be a sloppy biochemist and still get a, a decent result. Um, the response is rapid, happens within tens of seconds. It's a synchronous activation. So you can watch things as they, as they happen as a function of time and see as, as factors get recruited and, and machinery goes through the gene. And that sets certain limits on to what those factors might be doing. The principles and underlying mechanisms are proving to be, uh, be general, much more general than I expected. And finally, polytene chromosomes of flies and certain tissues provide a unique amplified signal and resolution to look at the chromosomes and look at active transcription as it's happening. So the heat shock response, we've learned a lot about this. Uh, in, in uninduced cells, uh, you'll see evidence that there's polymerase already present on the uninduced promoter not on the gene body, but on the promoter. There's uh, work from the Honda lab shows that there's, been, there's NELF and DSIF associated with uh, the stabilizing that pause polymerase, the general transcription factors there. There's a GAGA factor that we, you'll, you'll hear more about. There's a master regulatory protein, heat shock factor, that doesn't associate very strongly with the uninduced gene or at, at its heat shock elements, but upon heat shock, it trimerizes and binds very tightly to the, uh, to the activated genes or enhancers that are nearby the genes. And this recruits the PTFB kinase, which then allows this pause polymerase now to escape very rapidly, about once every six seconds, so that the polymerases are stacked on the gene about as tightly as they can go in response to heat shock. So that's the model. And let me just start by going through uh, an optical observation of, of how, this, um, how these genes operate. This is, was facilitated, as I mentioned, because of polytene chromosomes. These uh, chromosomes uh, in, these, in, in these salivary glands, these chromosomes are, um, have undergone uh, many, uh, 10 rounds of duplication. So now we have 1,000 chromatids, and they remain aligned in an interphase extended state. And they take on structure that we can see here for bands and interbands very characteristic, you can know where you are on the chromosome, what loci and genes are next to. And they come, these chromosomes come from these uh, salivary gland cells that when we break open the cells and spread the chromosomes, you now have these dead chromosomes that you can look at, which have been very valuable. Here's a mitotic chromosome on the same scale. So you can see these are really giant, wonderful structures. I was fascinated by these immensely when I started working in Drosophila. I still am. Actually, um, and um, and so in a collaboration with Watt Webb's group, if you remember, <clears throat> a number of you may remember his great contributions to optical science here in, at Cornell. Uh, we had a joint student, J. G. Yao, who uh, we decided it would be interesting to take a look at the the polytene chromosomes using two photon laser scanning microscopy, a technology they had working. And, it, and later on that week, he came back with these pictures of optical sections taken every half, half micron sections through a, a salivary gland. And we could see going from one end to the other, you get this fantastic view. And, uh, and notice that you could map, begin mapping particular chromosomal sites even in this three-dimensional structure. So this optical section approach worked pretty nicely. You could identify specific loci, which meant that you could, in principle, uh, track the recruitment and dynamics and interactions of proteins like GFP tag proteins at specific native loci in real time in living cells. And the operation can be done with lasers, uh, this two photon laser scanning, but we can also get comparable results and faster with a, a spinning, a state of the art spinning, spinning disc microscope. <coughs> and so uh, Katie Zobeck and, um, and uh, and Buckley went down and collected a lot of data of this sort. And, and what we use in this is we have two match lenses, uh, one at 22 degrees one and one at 37, the heat shock temperature. And, and you can then uh, make a, a variety of transgenic fly lines. We made a variety of lines that have GFP and RFP tag transcription factors uh, and, uh, and looked at the various combinations. So first at 22 degrees, you take optical stacks of the green and, and the red channels to get two proteins map simultaneously, and then you can shift the lenses. And the heat capacity of the lens is such that we know from, uh, from direct measurements that, that the salivary gland 
uh, increases temperature in about six seconds. So you can begin immediately taking, watching the time course of gene activation caused by this warm lens that uh, activates gene expression. So let me just show you a, a, a set of movies that are synchronized here that uh, have, we can watch heat shock factor, Paul II, PTFB kinase, that famous kinase I mentioned to you, elongation factor, SPD6, and a topoisomerase one, all of which get recruited upon heat shock to major heat shock loci. We're gonna follow a couple of major heat shock loci, the ones that uh, have the HSP70 genes there. And so let me start this movie and I'm gonna stop it really quickly. I so here is the view um, at 18 seconds. So there's already a signal that begins showing up with the master regulatory protein heat shock factor. So it's, it's not there at the beginning, right? Or very low at the beginning, but upon heat shock, um, it gets recruited, saturates with about, in about two minutes, then Paul II starts coming in, and then along with PTFB kinase, and then these other elongation factors. Here's just plotted out the results from many, many nuclei and actually multiple salivary glands showing the standard error. So it's a highly reproducible, highly synchronized process. HSF saturates by two minutes, followed by polymerase and PTFB and then the other factors. And so from this kind of analysis, we, we know that the activation is uh, of different nuclei and polyteen cells is synchronous. HSF is rapidly recruited to heat shock loci within 20 seconds, it saturates by two minutes. Um, and then it's followed by this Paul II and PTFB kinase. And finally, this shows that transcription factors are assembled on these heat shock genes, uh, rather than heat shock genes being transported to some factory as a, some models sort of profess, that you move genes around to places that are transcribed. Instead, we, we think at least uh, in, in these systems that, that you assemble uh, the factory at the site of the gene. So uh, in part two here, we're gonna investigate promoter proximal clausing, okay? And we'll start by examining the very early evidence, biochemical evidence for clausing that got me into this, got our lab into this uh, problem of studying uh, this type of transcriptional control that was not appreciated at the time. <coughs> So um, the first experiments that led us to the idea, I'm gonna go over four experiments extremely quickly. So you can, they're published a long time ago. So they're, if you wanna read more about it, please do. But let me just give you the essence of these experiments. There's a UV chip experiment. This is a cross-linking immunoprecipitation. It was uh, worked by Dave Gilmore. It was actually the first of these cross-linking immunoprecipitation experiments later became chip experiments uh, and chip seek and other things. But this was a precursor of those kinds of experiments that then Varshavsky adopt, ad, uh, adapted. It told us, we looked, decided to look at RNA polymerase itself both before and after heat shock because we thought that'd be a good way to develop this technology. Before heat shock, polymerase covered the entire gene, but in the uninduced gene, polymerase was also giving a signal and by doing uh, restriction digestion and look probing the DNA that co-precipitates when we after cross-linking and amino precipitation, we're able to pinpoint that polymerase to between minus 12 and plus 65. So this is right at the start. And at high concentrations, we estimated one polymerase per gene. What's the status of that polymerase? Could it simply be bound to the promoter? No, nuclear run-on experiments done by Ann Rugby showed that, that uh, you could block new initiation with high concentrations of salt or sarcosyl. And, and release this polymerase into, into elongation in a nuclear run-on experiment. So you can make that polymerase move and incorporate radioactive nucleotides. And, those, and we could see that those polymerases map to this same region. Uh, precisely where they map was, map, uh, was done by uh, Eric Rasmussen, where he fished out these RNAs and sized them. And then finally, we checked in vivo by completely orthogonal method uh, using permanganate potassium permanganate, which maps single-stranded T's in these bubbles. And we could see that there were hypersensitive T's uh, associated with the promoter region, even in, in non-heat shock cells. And so all of this data points to this polymerase in this model I've shown here, has engaged in transcription, made a short RNA of 20 to 50 nucleotides, depending on the gene, and it's, uh, and it's paused and it can be 
made to transcribe in the presence of sarcosyl and, uh, or high salt that removes some of the, we know extracts some of the barriers that get, keep it paused. So, um, so these targeted studies in, in the 80s and 90s uh, were uh, kind of ignored, I would say, in the early stages. And that was because the, the, the field was focused on yeast as a model system in transcription, which does not show pausing. And we've gone back with some of our genome-wide methods now and show that yeast does, the Saccharomyces cerevisiae does not show pausing. Um, but in the mid uh, 2000s or 2000, around 2005, we, we were developing for some very sophisticated, uh, people were developing sophisticated genome-wide methods for mapping polymerase. Chip, chip experiments were being done where you could chromatin IP and then probe uh, uh, these microarrays that cover the genome and then experiment in, in, in some of those techniques, as you will see, were replaced by more sophisticated observation methodologies. And one of the early experiments by Bing Ren done in a uh, human lung fibroblast line, IMR90, showed that a ribosomal protein gene uh, that there was polymerases piled up on the promoter. Now, this is a gene that you theoretically, I mean, that we knew is expressed. And so these, these reads in the, in the gene body were real, but we were, I mean, uh, most people were surprised that there would be so much polymerase sort of piled up on the promoter uh, if, if we were simply transcribing this gene. And, but this was a little reminiscent of the pause polymerase we saw in HSP70, except it was centered right at the start site rather than being displaced downstream. And a number of other labs were also able to uh, see these, this pile up of polymerase on various promoters and various systems in Drosophila and, uh, and in uh, other human cells, uh, work from Rick Young's lab, uh, Karen Edelman and Mike Levine. And so we wondered if we could uh, uh, evaluate whether this polymerase was a, a pre-initiation complex that is simply bound or was it paused? And, and it, in the original papers, it was interpreted to be a pre-initiation complex, but we wondered if we could contribute to this uh, process of, of characterizing these, gene, these polymerases on promoters genome-wide by developing a new method. And Leighton Core, who was an extremely talented grad student um, at the time, decided to take on this project of, uh, of developing something that we now call GrowSeq, Global Run-On Sequencing. And, and the idea is simple, you know, you, if you isolate nuclei, you have polymerases on genes, some of them at the pause site, some of them on the gene body. And the idea is to let those polymerases run on in the presence of nucleotides, in particular, a nucleotide that has an affinity tag, like bromo-UTP. There are antibodies to bromo-UTP that you can use then to fish out what we call the nascent RNA. So you run on, you get these bromo-U's incorporated, uh, and then uh, you, it's a controlled run on 100 bases. You can then isolate the RNA, base hydrolyze that down to 100 bases so that you can map precisely where the polymerase was. And uh, this is followed by you know, these affinity purifications. At each step of the library preparation, there are three purifications. And spike in controls told us that, that there's about a, nearly a million fold purification of the nascent RNA. So it provides a very clean source of, of mapping where polymerase is precisely. <coughs> and make a library and then you sequence heavily. And so this was our first look at this. I remember this arriving one night, uh, one afternoon, and, and it was a disc full of things on a disc. And we were <laughs> trying, trying to figure out what to, how, to, how to get a look at what, what this was telling us. But by the end of the night, fortunately we had a, uh, Josh Waterfall here was a physicist who could handle this kind of thing. And by the end of the night, we had these browser shots. We were very, very excited. And here's the pattern of, transcription of genes. You can see genes going left to right are shown in red, right to left are in blue. We can see this pattern over this 2.5 megabase region. Uh, you can see the genes stand out very nicely. Uh, and we can get a close-up view by expanding this little region here. Uh, and you can take a look at a single gene. And we did this in uh, lung fibroblasts, the same experiment that uh, Bing Ren did. Uh, well, the same cell line that Bing Ren used, and here's Bing Ren's data showing the, the chip chip results, and here's the, uh, the grow seq results, and we can see that, that there's a striking peak of pause polymerase just downstream from the transcription start. There's another pause going in the opposite direction that surprised us, and it's turned out to be general. Polymerase is going the other direction. The sum of the two 
gives us polymerase that's centered when the transcription starts. So it didn't look like it was paused in this case, but indeed uh, it's paused in both directions, polymerase. And so this was a uh, surprising feature of the architecture of mammalian promoters. And indeed it's general. Uh, we can see and there's metagene analysis. We're lining up genes left to right here. Uh, and we, in, in, we can see in, in the red direction, we're looking at the transcription of the gene. There's uh, on, on average, very striking pausing taking place. This is gene body levels. And we see this uh, upstream antisense transcription, even if we remove any upstream genes. And this is just a feature of promoters. So uh, the majority of promoters show pause, PAL2 in both directions. And we also looked in Drosophila, and we see a similar pausing going on, striking pause genes here. Some genes don't show pausing, but uh, the majority, uh, greater than 70% of genes show some significant pausing. In Drosophila, there isn't divergent transcription at promoters. Drosophila is a little smarter than we are, I think, and they, and they send polymerase in the correct direction. Um, we can talk about that at the end if you're interested in how, how, how flies are so smart. Okay, so just to reiterate what these, these patterns are. So if this green is the density of polymerase, we see that there's a pileup of polymerase at the, this pause site. So the way we interpret that is that there are factors that recruit the polymerase with the, this big arrow showing the recruitment efficient. The release into productive elongation is less efficient, the small green arrow. And so we have a pileup of polymerases here. And, but there is some gene body level that we, we can detect. And then when a gene is activated, maybe new factors bind and bring in uh, this PTFB kinase and allow then uh, the increased escape or release into productive elongation and this gene body level can go up. Now we were curious, uh, and I should, I should add that there are these very specific inhibitors to the kin this PTFB kinase. And we were interested in you know, what fraction of the genes uh, are are dependent upon this PTFB kinase, this pause and release uh, uh, step. And so Iris Yonkers in, in uh, mouse ES cells then decided to, to add this PTFB kinase inhibitor uh, and, and, and look at what, how the pattern, this is the normal pattern of the gene, what would happen if we now block this with flavored pyridol? How will it change this pattern of transcription? We see here we're looking just the uh, reads in the no flavor pyridol case is a pileup uh, of polymerases. Each one of these lines represents uh, a separate gene. You can see the pileup of polymerases in both directions. And upon flavor pyridol treatment, we sh if we block the release, we should see the gene body go down, the pausing perhaps go up. And indeed, this is what she saw. If we look at, compare the 50 minutes relative to no flavor pyridol, the change ha that happens. Uh, here's a log 10 scale here. You can see the gene body goes down dramatically on all genes and uh, was pausing goes up on most genes. And the same is true for the antisense orientation. And here's just an example gene. This gene we wouldn't call as paused because it's not obvious, but when you add flavor pyridol and watch with time, you can see that the clip, the Transcribing polymerase is clear and they clear in this wave. You can actually measure that rate of that wave movement and get elongation rates for a thousand genes at a time by this method. And, uh, and but we can now see that this gene uh, piles up polymerase at the pause site. So, and in fact, you know, uh, virtually greater than 95% of genes behave in this way where they have to be going through this, they seem to be going through this pause release step, even if the pause isn't detectable. So this is a general mechanism, okay? So inclusions part two is most mammalian drosophila genes exhibit promoter proximal pausing. All active genes undergo a pause release that is dependent on this PTFB kinase. In the last section uh, we'll go through, uh, are you with me? Are you hanging in there? Is it, uh, okay. Fasten your seatbelts. So we want to now look at mechanisms. What can we learn from this uh, beyond what I've just told you? And so uh, Fabiana Duarte uh, 
decided to, to, to extend this and Drosophila looking more broadly at the heat shock response. Uh, and to, to do this, we, we also made use of a te technology that was developed by a, a rotating grad student, who's now a professor here, Ho Jun Quack, um, where um, he took GrowSeq and made it and, and provided base pair resolution, developed it to a base pair resolution, so precision run on sequencing or ProSeq. And the way this works is that um, we incorporate a, instead of a bromo U, a biotin NTP, and that chokes the polymerase. Let me just back off. Let me just back, sorry. Let me just back off a little bit. Oh, okay, we're already there. So what happens is the biotin gets incorporated and that chokes the polymerase, basically. Uh, if there are only biotin nucleotides present, you add one biotin, and so that marks the three prime end of where polymerase was. And then you can put linkers on and, and, uh, and sequence. And that, and as you sequence from the three prime end, you get the, the base pair precision where the active site of polymerase is, the density of polymerase genome-wide, um, genome-wide. And ProSeq features are very much like GrowSeq, and, and I'll just reiterate these, that we can get a distribution of transcriptionally gra uh, engaged RNA polymerases throughout the genome. These provide kinetic snapshots that are not affected by the background of accumulated mRNA. One can measure gene expression by mRNA, but if you want to see changes that happen, you have to wait for those pools to change. And instead, you can look directly right at the gene and see what happens in a minute or two by these methods to assess the, the, the changes that are either up or down in, in regulation. It's a strand-specific assay. It's highly sensitive. There's a dynamic range of nearly six orders of magnitude. Uh, it's base pair ProSeq now. It differs from uh, GrowSeq in that it's base pair resolution. And it's more robust and easier. So if any of you have tried GrowSeq and you said, I'll never try this again, try ProSeq. And there'll be newer methods coming out that we're, we're promising uh, will be a half-day protocol. For, don't, don't hold me to half-day, but, uh, but that's, that's what some of former students are arguing. Um, OK, so, um, so the hope was that by using ProSeq, uh, it's high resolution. And sensitivity could provide a, a very fine-grained pan panorama of the changes in transcription across the genome in response to regulatory signals, allowing insights into the steps uh, in transcription that are regulated. So we wanted to look at heat shock genes and heat shock response and watch the whole genome as it changes, right? And so we did took Drosophila cells, cell cultures, did a heat shock, and then took samples at 30 seconds, two minutes, five minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, and then did proceed. Replicates, we did replicates, of course, and, and this was work Fabiana Duarte with some help from Mike Gurton. We see these uh, good high correlations between replicates. We can then uh, begin looking at the difference between the, the zero time point, the non-heat shock, and the various time points here to see when differences significantly occur. And we can see that by five minutes, there are some differences that begin to occur. By 20 minutes, we have many hundreds of genes in pink here that are activated, many thousands of genes that are downregulated. And here's just examples of the, the kinetics changes. And we see this increased transcription within the course of this 20 minutes on the upregulated gene. And you see, uh, with comparable kinetics, a downregulation of transcription on those genes that are turned down. And um, now, uh, so, the major heat shock genes that we are all interested in show, all show pausing, and, 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 we, and we find that the level of pausing is generally high on the, on the heat shock activated genes. So we were wondering what, is, what are the factors that, that cause that pausing, that set up the pause to begin with. And one of the factors that jumped out at us was GAGA factor, which we had previously, previously shown was um, associated with uh, activated genes, as did Levine Lab and Gilmore Lab, uh, and uh, but it was not only it was rich certainly on HSB seventy, but it was also rich uh, on other pause genes generally. And when we look at where Gaga factor is on the heat shock activated genes, we do this analysis as of where do we find a Gaga factor binding site uh, by by Gaga factor chip signals that is the real binding sites. Where does it, where do they occur relative to the transcription site? Well, they occur be largely before the, the first 100 bases upstream. And so we see that this 70% um, of the uh, 
genes have a GAGA factor associated with them, of the activated genes. And we have to go much further out to find them in the case of repressed or unchanged genes. If we look by just the, a metagene analysis, where the GAGA factor is and how abundant it is in these various classes, we see on the activated genes, it's high and just upstream from the transcription start. So 75% of the activated genes seem to have this GAGA factor bound. But is this related to GAGA factor's role in pausing and heat shock activation? And to test that more directly, we, we did a, one of these perturbations where we, uh, Fabiana did a GAGA factor uh, RNAi, compared it to a control, LAC-Z, plus and minus heat shock, and then did ProSeq on all samples. And the knockdown does indeed work. That's uh, shown by this quantitative Western. And, uh, and uh, we can get different classes of genes out. The two I want to focus on is the is this red class where we see, we look at the GAGA factor of the LAC-Z RNAi ratio on the gene body, that is where has a GAGA factor knockdown led to a, a decrease in gene body transcription? We see that in red, and these are genes that are, uh, show decreased transcription, but also show, uh, also have GAGA factor associated with the promoter. However, there is a purple class where GAGA factor is bound, but, there is, but these genes, these act, heat shock activated genes, don't show any decrease. They don't care about GAGA factor. And so we have these two distinct classes, those that care about GAGA factor for expression and those that don't. And we can now look at how is that related to the pausing that's caused upon GAGA factor knockdown. If we take these GAGA uh, factor dependent heat shock inducible genes, shown in red here, we can see that um, yeah, we, don't use that. Uh, we can see that there's a that in the GAGA factor uh, RNAi knockdown, we we have uh, a decrease in in pausing, dramatic decrease in pausing. If we look at this other class, the purple class, uh, upon GAGA factor knockdown, there's there's no change in pausing. So. Um, and we can see this in, in browser shots as well. Here's a case, we have the control, we, we see the pause polymerase, GAGA factor knockdown, we lose the pause polymerase. Control, we see gene activation upon, upon heat shock, but we fail to see that heat shock activation. And so GAF is needed for activation on those genes where GAGA factor is also needed for pausing. And, and there's this independent class where GAGA factor is bound, where uh, pausing nor Transcription depends on, on GAGA factor. So something else must be substituting for that. But let's first deal with how GAGA factor is working. There was uh, studies in the past by uh, Carl Wu that showed that uh, there were uh, uh, associations of GAGA factor with a remodeler, a nucleosome remodeler, which made some sense. So that remodeler is called NERF. So the idea being that maybe GAGA factor interacts with NERF and that clears open a promoter allowing polymerase to enter at this very early step to create <clears throat> the recruited polymerase and the pause site. Consistent with that, uh, recent studies by, uh, by Julius Judd, a new student in the lab, has sh shown that uh, by CHIP-seq or related version of that assay called cut and run, we can, we can map polymerase on genes and we can see where the GAGA factors are located and we can see then where that NERF tends to co-localize with with that. So consistent with the model, we find um, NERF localizing with GAGA factor in vivo. We then tested the effects of a GAGA factor knockdown genome-wide on, on nucleosomes. Do, it, are we clearing nucleosomes um, with GAGA factor? And if we knock down GAGA factor, do we see nucleosomes filling in? And so to do that, we can map where nucleosomes are with this enzyme called micrococcal nuclease, digests away the DNA that isn't protected by the nucleosome. And if we now uh, take that DNA and do paired end sequence from each side, we can get a the position of where every nucleosome is in the genome and, and thus get a measure of nucleosome occupancy. Well, nucleosomes are, tend to be depleted at the promoters. And you see that in, in two classes. This is the control knockdown with lack, just a lack Z, where we see those that show reduced pausing uh, still have this open promoter. Those that are unaffected by the GAGA factor knockdown are also behaving similarly. 
But if we now knock down Gaga factor, what happens is nucleosomes fill in. They fill in over the promoter region. So Gaga factor seems to be needed to keep this region free of nucleosomes. So in the model, here is we have factors. Uh, we have this open promoter, Gaga factor, NERF, open the promoter, allowing polymerase to create the, the pause polymerase. Upon heat shock, we now have the polymerase firing. Uh, we, HSF1 binds, brings in, we think, PDFB kinase to allow the, we know PDFB kinase allows the firing of polymerase and we get a full response. In the Gaga factor depletion, we, we block the process at an early step in that nucleosomes can fill in on these promoters, block the formation of pause polymerase, and these genes are no longer activatable. Um, now, I mentioned that there are promoters that are independent, that are Gaga factor independent of pausing, and they show association with a second factor, M1DP, that had been characterized by Dave Gilmore, and, and indeed, um, the, the, these are dependent on M1DP for both pausing and heat shock activation. So there are two different proteins that can set up the pause and, 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 and act as we think to uh, allow then the activation. So why pause, you might ask? And what's, what's all this wasted effort? Yeah. Um, one reason is we, we think is uh, Gaga factor, while it helps keep nucleosomes off, a polymerase is a, is, a, is a great foot in the door of traumatin, keeping the, this region open. And indeed, uh, Karen Edelman's lab has found that the pause polymerase itself, if you disrupt it, you can see nucleosomes filling in on many promoters as well. Um, and, uh, and this keeping this open may be very critical in early development, especially in flies. We know where genes are turned on very, very rapidly in very specific stages. And Levine, Mike Levine has shown very nicely that this is uh, uh, very important and, it's very, and all the genes that prescribe this early uh, embryonic development show striking pausing and, and, and require that pausing for their effect. Um, and another reason I think we have pausing is, is uh, because it gives us a, a two steps which to regulate gene expression. So we have this Gaga factor working at this first step, allowing the recruitment by opening up the chromatin. And once polymerase is, is, is recruited, we know it moves very quickly to the pause site. We don't see initiation being rate limiting. And, uh, and then a second factor, heat shock factor, we postulate then has the ability, we know it has the ability to bring in PTFB, and that influences the second step of pause escape, pause release, so we can, causes the phosphorylation of these components, and now polymerase can release. This gives us two different factors that can, can operate in a synergistic way on, a, on, a, on an, an event that's a certain advantages to getting high dynamic range, but also a way of interpreting regulatory signals and, and integrating those signals to give a specific kind of response. So I think that's why you might be having factors working at distinct stages. But is HSF1 really working at this stage? And so, We've uh, examined um, HSF uh, dependent heat, uh, heat shock activated genes, looking at their response in a controlled knockdown, lax Z. And we see uh, before heat shock, we get this pattern. And upon, after heat shock, this set of genes shows on average this increased transcription, as you'd expect from a heat shock gene. Now, if we knock down HSF1, this pausing is still the same but we see in Drosophila, and we see this uh, decrease in gene body. And we interpret that to mean that HSF1 is working at the second step of, of releasing the polymerase into productive elongation. If you block it, you don't have HSF1. If you knock it down, you can't do that second step. Okay. Um, so historically, you know, we, this has been uh, an area where a lot of attention has been uh, focused for regulation. We think that there are very, really two major steps. Step of recruitment, once recruited, polymerase moves very quickly to the pause site. This is regulated by factors like Gaga factor. Then we have release of pausing that's regulated by other kinds, many, many kinds of transcription factors, including heat shock factor. It's, this is general. Uh, we've seen this in mouse and human cells. And, uh, and I'm gonna just skip this next bit and go right to the 
to the last little bit. Hang with me. We may have a, only a few minutes for questions. Um, no, I can't. <laughs> well, 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 we'll skip the very end bit. I'm sorry. I'm sorry for the guys who are doing the optimal technology. We, we, we don't quite have time for that. Anyway, <laughs> takes a full hour. Okay, so um, we look now in mouse and human behave very similarly. You know, the gene body uh, upon heat shock, uh, we see, we look at this full change on genes. We see there's, they're, they're increased, and these are HSF1 dependent genes that have HSF1 bound to their promoters. And we see that in an HSF1 minus minus, a knockout of, a, of this master regulatory protein, we don't see this activation of transcription. So this gene body transcription needs HSF1. You can also look at the pause region. The pause region in mammals also goes up, unlike Drosophila. And, and it's independent though, however, of HSF1. And, uh, and so our model is this, that, that upon heat shock, uh, we, we have this increase in a release that's HSF1 dependent. So now we flood the gene with polymerases. And then we have uh, an increase, a somewhat increase of, of cause polymerase formation, but that's HSF1 independent. And so this, this happens at promoters, but it also, uh, we, we're seeing that there are enhancers that are also activated. I mean, not all heat shock activated genes have HSF1 bound close to them. In some cases, they're HSF1 dependent, but their the HSF must be acting at a distance because there's no HSF1 bound near it. So we know that HSF1 is part of enhancers. And we can find some of the, we can find these globally by looking in non-heat shock and heat shock and seeing with, with these, these sites of transcriptional activation. We know that enhancers, when they get activated, it's another story, but when enhancers get activated, they, they show increased divergent transcription, much like we see on mammalian promoters. Uh, HSF1 is associated with those activated genes. Here we're just looking at the changes in gene body transcription, uh, you know, gene transcription, and those that tend to go up in heat shock tend to have HSF1 associated. Uh, likewise, the transcription we see at enhancers uh, is often associated with HSF1, but there's a lot of gray dots here which represent uh, cases where we see increased transcription, but no HSF1. And the model I want to leave you with here is, is um, um, the following. So we have here genes, the majority of transcribed genes are turned down in response to heat shock. So we have a, this massive repression of thousands of genes and it's repressed at the step of pause release. So just, just like activation is influencing pause release, the, the inhibition leads, leaves us with the pause polymerase and the polymerases that are, we're transcribing clear and enter a pool. Now, those that are primed for activation in response to heat shock, after heat shock, HSF1 binds, and we, uh, and we see the increased transcription, and we think this pool of polymerases that's coming from these mammalian, often very long genes, lots of polymerase, start filling in and help the induced genes stay active. If we look at enhancers, we, we see increased transcription upon heat shock, and some of those are HSF1 bound, and we see increased transcription. But there are others that show no HSF1 there that, are, um, that are also show increased transcription. They have lineage-specific factors. They have factors there, but they don't have heat shock factor there. And these go up, we think, because of mass action. We have all these polymerases being contributed from this pool of repressed genes that now are filling by mass action. And we want to test that hypothesis. So I'm just going to say that we're, we've been working for 25 years on RNA aptamers, um, trying to develop these as ways of interfering with macromolecular interactions, because most of biology is driven by large macromolecular contacts. And, and, uh, and, and, and if we could get big inhibitors that could interfere with protein-protein interactions or protein-nucleic protein acid interactions, then we'd have the power to uh, really begin testing a lot of our models much more rigorously. And these aptamers, you know, could be very useful as, as inhibitors. We select RNA aptamers. You can envision you could block one surface of a protein without destroying the protein. 
and have the potential to act quickly, disrupt macromolecular interactions, and, and potentially have a high success rate. I just want to say that the way you get aftermers is by a process called SELEX, which I'm not going to have time to go into, but basically you select for binding and then reselect for binding and, and you do eight, eight to 20 cycles of this and you burn out a graduate student. And, and, um, and, uh, but in the end, you, you'll get an aftermer with high affinity for a target. And so over the past few years, uh, Abdullah Ozer and, and our Harold Craighead's group uh, collaborating to, to improve all of this. So we've improved both the RNA library, we have a library of about 10 to the 16th random 70 MERS now. Uh, that's really, really good. We've improved partitioning approaches, which I really won't go into, but you can see now we can scale up to something like 96 of these at a time. Our goal is to start churning these out in massive ways on targeting transcription factors and other factors of all sort. And finally, barcoding and Illumina sequencing it takes the expense out of characterizing you know, 96 of these at a time if one wanted. We've only done 28 at a time in a single lane. So doing this, we, we're targeting our major factors. And, uh, and Judy G. Ray has, has recently had some huge success with the DSIF aftermer, up with the analysis by Abdullah Oza, in that we, we can have an aftermer that binds very tightly. We know where the region where it does bind. And so we can then uh, show in collaboration with Dave Gilmore that the, these the, this aptamer interferes with the ability of this DSIF, this pausing factor, to inter, interfere with the binding of polymerase. Here we see a band shift showing the uh, binding of DSIF and the fact that an aptamer will block that even if added after. And then lastly, the last slide here I, I'll show you is, is uh, the last data slide, is that there's, uh, when you now express these in cells, we can see a control aptamer shows this pausing in this gene expression. Uh, transcription right to left, this is left to right in blue. And we can see that this is reproducible upon Gaga factor knockdown, excuse me, upon aftermer addition, we, we see a decrease in pausing and this is reproducible in this replica. There's just one case, there's another case, there's an even more dramatic change, uh, loss, loss of the pause site and it's reproducible in the replicates. And we see many genes change, 220. Most of them show this decrease. Some show shifts or de increases, but also shifts in pausing, as though the pausing is disrupted at one side and may be piling up at another. We're still in the early analysis of this. And I just want to say, in conclusion, that the transcription factors can act to establish pause polymerase or release pause polymerase. Gaga factor acting first, HSF1 acting later. We suspect this is a general model. Most active enhancers are divergently transcribed. The massive heat shock down regulation releases Paul II that loads on promoters by mass action, feeding both the activated stress gene and I think priming the response to, to, to normality. You're, you're, you're holding the promoters open, you're holding the enhancers open by this uh, polymerase filling at, at the promoters of both enhancers and, and, uh, and gene promoters. Then RNA afterwards, I'm arguing, will, I hope will serve as uh, large drugs that will be general and allow us to interrupt transcription in vivo. And I want to thank all the people in my group and especially the saints who were responsible for this particular work. Um, and uh, not that the others are sinners, uh, but uh, they're doing different projects. Okay. Thanks for your attention. I'm sorry I went over. I... Yes. Yeah, I'll give quick answers to this yeah, chip. Showed actually most of the actually is uh, the pulsing is active fight direction, right? Yeah. So fight direction. Yep. So are those because of those uh, fight direction promoter or just happen to be? Yeah. Uh, so so there's kind of promoters. Yeah. So there are core promoters for, for both of those in both directions, and you'll you'll find them at both promoters and enhancers in mammals. In Drosophila, you 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 have more elements that contribute to to. Uh, orientation on promoters uh -huh. and so promoters tend to fire the polymerase in one way the, the factors that, that, that regulate tend to be between these transcription start sites in fact we we think enhancers both in in mammals and drosophila we see enhancers have this pattern we think the enhancer is defined by the pause to pause region which has the core two core promoters and uh, a, a cluster of transcription factor regulatory binding sites and we think that's the unit structure, a basic unit structure of enhancers.
right? Why doesn't yeast do this? Well, let's find another way to do it. Not all yeast don't do this. It turns out Pombi has something that resembles this, but there's no NELF in, in yeast. There's no NELF in plants. We looked at plants, by the way, plants. Um, you probably heard the talks given from Jean-Luc's group by uh, Roberto. Uh, I think I hope, hope some of you heard those. That in, in cassava, there, there is uh, something that looks like pausing, just like in Pombi, the yeast Pombi. Saccharomyces doesn't have it. But there's no NELF in either case. And so I don't know if it's a real pause. It, in, in, we know in Pombi, our recent studies of that show that the polymerase is moving more slowly. There's a maturation step, but it isn't a strict pause. Um, plants also have this divergent transcription ad, and enhancers, it turns out. So we've seen that in cassava and now in, in corn. And, and these are the places where a lot of the critical SNPs are, are located, looks like. <clears throat> Yes. Do you know if there are repeated cycles of stress? Is there adaptation so that the yeah. multiples change? Great, great, Josh. Uh, yeah, so uh, I should know this better. Um, is Ani here? <laughs> uh, you want to answer that question? What's that? Oh, you didn't hear the question. So the question is upon, re oh, I should have been repeating all the other questions. Upon repeated cycles of, of heat shock, is there any adaptation? Uh, and uh, Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but 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 this but it 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 does come back to normal. It it comes back to the to the non heat shock state pretty quickly and pretty completely, except for a few things that are kind of important. Uh, <laughs> I, I I could go into more detail, but uh, what is it? The apoptosis genes uh, tend to be primed. Four four hours basically the transcription of profile is restored. But some uh, genes retain higher pausing. And we see also faster release of the pause upon the activates when you create each other. So that's the simple answer. But I'm happy to discuss later if you want to. Okay. Great. So, so I'm, I'm uh, yeah, if people want to, I'll, I'll hang outside the door if people have other questions. Sir. Sorry, I went over. Okay. This has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.